Biological information, information and thermodynamics in living systems. We've been talking about the book Biological Information for the past uh, several weeks. Um, the book is entitled uh, New Perspectives. It's uh, uh, edited by several different people. Bruce Gordon edits the last of the um, sets of chapters on uh, self-organization. Um, it was published by World Scientific uh, Publishing Company in uh, 2013. It was a, the symposium, a product of a symp symposium in uh, uh, 2011 at Cornell University. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it was supposed to be published by uh, Springer Verlag, and uh, somebody got wind of it and made a lot of noise and basically convinced Springer Verlag to back down on publishing it. Um, and um, it can be found for free on the internet in chapters. Uh, you can download the PDFs. Um, it can, uh, you can also buy it as a book. It's um, quite expensive, but uh, in my opinion, worth uh, buying if you have the money simply to support World Scientific Publishing because of uh, their courageous stand, in my opinion. Book looks something like that. And um, some of you will notice that I have stolen the, the uh, uh, part of the uh, front page is my background. Um, at first, we'll have a, uh, uh, the book starts with a general introduction, inter information theory and biology, biological information and genetic theory. Theoretical molecular biology and biological information and self-organizational complexity theory. Um, uh, this week we're finishing up information theory and biology. We'll be going to biological information and genetic theory. Chapter by Jonathan Wells, which is just packed with stuff and um, very rich, actually. Um, and I, I think that uh, will be very interesting for most of us, certainly is interesting for me. Information Theory and Thermodynamics in Living Systems is the chapter we're looking at now, which is written by Andy McIntosh of the, of the University of Leeds. And um, the abstract will give you a good introduction to where uh, Dr. McIntosh is going. Are there laws of th information exchange, and how do the principles of thermodynamics connect with the communication of information? Um, we consider first the concept of information and examine the various alternatives for its definition. The reductionist approach has been to regard information as arising out of matter and energy. In such an approach, coded information systems such as DNA are regarded as accidental in terms of the origin of life. And it is argued that these then lead, led to the evolution of all life forms as a process of incre increasing complexity by natural selection operating on mutations of these first forms of life. However, scientists in the discipline of thermodynamics have long been aware that organizational systems are inherently systems with low local entropy and have argued that the only way to have consistency with an evolutionary model of the universe and common descent of all life forms is to posit a flow of low entropy into the Earth's environment. And in this second approach, they suggest that islands of low entropy form organizational structures found in living systems. A third alternative proposes that information is in fact non-material and that the coded information systems, such as but not restricted to the coding of DNA in all living systems, is not defined at all by the biochemistry or physics of the molecules used to store the data. Rather than matter and energy defining the information sitting on the polymers of life, this approach posits that the reverse is in fact the case. Information has its definition outside the matter and energy on which it sits, and furthermore constrains it to operate in a highly non-equilibrium thermodynamic uh, environment. This proposal resolves the thermodynamic issues and invokes the correct paradigm for understanding the vital area of thermodynamic 
or organizational interactions, which despite the effort of from alternative paradigms has not given a satisfactory explanation of the way information in systems operates. Starting from the paradigm of information being defined by non-material arrangement and coding, one can then postulate the idea of the laws of information exchange which have some parallel with the laws of thermodynamics which undergird such an approach. These issues are explored tentatively in this paper and lay the groundwork for further investigative study. Introduction. In 1981, Kenneth Miller of Brown University commented on the famous Stanley Miller Harold Urey experiments, made an assertion concerning the laws of thermodynamics and the origin of life, particularly as it pertains to the formation of the nucleotide adenine. Actually, that should be the base adenine. Nucleotide would have uh, adenine attached to ribose, attached to phosphate. One of the nucleotides needed in living systems, which is definitely true uh, once you get to the nucleotide, from hydrogen cyanide. The part of this quote in square, square brackets has been added to clarify the context of the remark. And this is the Miller quote. All this needs is energy in the system. Adenine is far more complex than hydrogen cyanide. It forms. Why? Because it's consistent with the second law of thermodynamics, which says you can have an increase in complexity if energy is available for the system. And you know what's remarkable? Adenine is the most important base in living things and is the first thing that forms, and it forms easily. Talk about selective quoting. Adenine looks like that, and yes, if you count the hydrogen here and the hydrogen here, you can actually break this up into five hydrogen cyanides, although one of them is not contiguous. There's an HCN here, there's an HCN here, there's an HCN here. Uh, there is one of these H's has to be brought down to make an HCN here, and the other H N and C have to be here. So there's a little bit of rearrangement it's not just strictly polymeriza polymerization, but it does work. Now, one thing that's kind of not remarked in that particular quote that's interesting that Macintosh doesn't bring out is that the major product of uh, the Miller-Urey type experiments in most cases, uh, in almost all cases actually, is hydrogen cyanide. That's probably not something you were taught in, uh, in school. Uh, probably because people instinctively know that hydrogen cyanide is not really good for most life, including humans. But um, be that as it may, the essence of the throwaway remark uh, oh, the other thing that's not being told is that guanine and cytosine and uracil are much, much more difficult to form and much more difficult to get to react with ribose. <coughs> so he picked the easy one and said, see, you can do this part e easily and kind of is not telling you that the other parts are much more difficult. The essence of the throwaway we remark, all this needs is energy in the system, is an appeal to the natural laws of nature to produce, in the end, the structures necessary to create life. It has often been used in the debate on origins when it comes to the thermodynamic issues. Kenneth Miller was not saying that the Miller-Urey experiment had proved conclusively that life could be formed from a mixture of water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. However, he was stating that such examples of nucleotide productions are demonstrations that a useful structure could rise spontaneously as long as enough energy is available. Not any useful structure, just one particular useful structure. The idea that all one needs is to just add energy is considered in this paper along with the issue of information. <coughs> John Sanford of Cornell commenting in some of his introductory writings for this conference on the progress made since the human genome was mapped in 2001 has stated, Few anticipated the astounding discoveries of the last 10 years, which have revealed the biological information even in simple cells is much more complex than we could ever have 
we could have even ima imagined. Indeed, we now realize that the simplest free living organism reflects a virtual labyrinth of information. A single cell represents layer upon layer of information, each layer of information being encrypted within a great diversity of molecular types, each type of information being encoded via its own set of linguistic signals. Within a single living cell is an active communication network, something like the Internet. And what we can see of this biological Internet is expanding daily. This is forcing many scientists to re-examine our earlier understanding of biological information. Even while the amount of biological complexity requiring explanation has been expanding exponentially, the traditional e explanations of biological information have been unraveling. So the explanatory power of evolution has been getting worse because we're realizing that it doesn't do as much as everybody thought it did while at the same time the problem that it's trying to solve gets worse. That's not a recipe for a good explanation. The concept of information has in fact been a major issue since the discovery by Francis Crick and James Watson of the coding structure of DNA in 1953. Crick himself stated, if the code does indeed have some logical foundation, then it is legitimate to consider all the evidence, both good and bad, in any attempt to deduce it. And uh, this was stated in the context of the discovery that triplets of nucleotides running along the rungs of the double helix molecule of DNA contained, carry information to code for a specific amino acid, which then makes up the proteins of the living organism. Crick was always of a reductionist mindset and had no sympathy with any approach which regarded the coding as essentially an expression of a non-material intelligence transcendent to the polymer itself. And the above statement in, in its original context is most definitely not advocating an exploration of information in any other paradigm than a purely materialist uh, approach. He's saying that so nobody accuses him of being, uh, uh, of quote mining. That is, he realizes this, this comes from an evolutionist who has evolutionary beliefs. However, it is significant because it shows that scientific investigation can be trapped only by, by only considering one pathway. And then he, Macintosh asks the question, what if the search for logical foundation advocated by Crick actually leads one to the edge of the material region of scientific inquiry? And uh, I might add, and maybe suggest uh, pushing oneself beyond the edge. Stephen Jay Gould wrote of non-overlapping magisteria, often re referred to with the acronym NOMA, in order to resolve the issues of how to approach both science describing the physical realm and the metaphysical and philosophical concepts describing realities which are essentially non-material. This is diagrammatically shown in figure two, which we'll show in just a minute. However, such an approach to reality means that the investigations of the area of information and software, mind, and consciousness um, this view incorrectly locks the investigator into a materialistic approach which at the outset denies per se the most persuasive explanation for the intricate systems which have come to be understood in recent years. In his idea, the natural sciences are part of the physical world. Um, it's interesting to ask the question, do the natural sciences cover the entire physical world? And some people would argue that they do, and some people would argue there's things beyond. But then there's a non-material reality which simply is completely disconnected. The antithesis, the antithesis to Gold's approach is illustrated in figure three. It is argued that there is a legitimate realm where information, mind, and consciousness lie. This area is undoubtedly interacting with the physical realm, but is not entirely controlled by it. Though this clearly can have metaphysical implications, we are not here talking about religious matters, but simply to the area where thoughts, logic, and mind exist, and where the importance of arrangement rather than matter itself is dominant, as for instance in the sequencing of the nucleotides in DNA. And uh, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the picture that he's given. Now, I'm kind of interested in this because 
there are two questions that I would ask about this way of picturing things. I think there is overlap, but first of all, if you have material reality and non-material reality, doesn't that cover the entire whole of reality? I'm not sure what this region out here is supposed to contain. And secondly, it is arguable that non-material reality actually encompasses the physical world as well. That material reality is simply a subset of, of all reality. The paradigm adopted here is the assumption that information is essentially defined as non-material, but profoundly influences the material in which it is found, in a similar way that software is essentially coded non-material instructions, but nevertheless controls the hardware of a computer. It should be emphasized that this is not a license for any lazy thinking, whereby anything which cannot be understood is put metaphorically into a box labeled non-material and not to be further investigated. This is no god of the gaps thesis. Indeed, once adopted, this approach opens out a whole raft of new research routes which properly explain the control of living systems. A far more profound methodology is in view. What is being advocated here is an entirely different paradigm whereby the non-material message is accepted as being of an origin outside the area of physical investigation, but that its effect can readily be seen in the organization of the molecular machinery in living organisms. Now, the yellow ellipses are mine. I am not reading you the entire paper, partly because I want to have time at the end to discuss it. Um, so you will see ellipses here and there where I'm skipping over stuff, like the entire next paragraph. Furthermore, recent research has confirmed that non-coding parts of DNA previously thought to be junk DNA are now, are in fact, not to be regarded as such. More research is coming to light that the very folding of protein carries with it a separate form of information transfer. This intertwining of information and matter lies at the heart of what is life itself and fundamentally changes our view of how to understand living systems. Biological information storage and retrieval, thermodynamic I issues. There are major thermodynamic hurdles in arguing that the emergence of DNA could come about by a random gathering together of the sugar phosphates and nucleotides. These are discussed in greater detail elsewhere. And I'm omitting the figure for a bit. In, e in essence, evolutionary arguments for the origin of information, for example, Dawkins, um, amount to appealing to random mutations as a means of increasing the range of possible phenotypic outcomes. The further appeal is often made to the concept of Shannon information. And I might add in insisting that Shannon information is the only meaning for information. Which idea comes from the basis that increased uncertainty can lead to a richer number of possibilities in a signal? This is sometimes termed Shannon, termed Shannon entropy. But as shown in reference 10 is in many ways the opposite of what is really needed since it is really a measure of the spread of mutations at the nucleotide level and these mutations are virtually all deleterious. It is probably fair to say that the majority view of science today holds the physic... Uh, you know what? Ignore that. That's a slide that was supposed to be removed and then somehow I missed it. There are two major obstacles to such a proposal. First, the code is highly sequence specific. Each triplet of nucleotides codes for a specific amino acid and the protein formed from these requires a specific sequence of such amino acids. For example, there are enzymes which are specifically assigned to repair nucleotide excision, specifically assigned to nucleotide excision repair. They recognize wrongly paired bases in the DNA nucleotides, A, T, C, and G, connecting the two deoxyribose sugar phosphate strands. This is summarized in figure 5b where the excision and repair of a damaged nucleotide base is shown. Mutations generally do not increase information content. Rather the reverse is true. The second obstacle is a more fundamental issue. At the molecular level the principle of thermodynamics do not permit the co formation of new machinery from that which is already set up or coded for in a particular function performed by the cells of living organisms. There is in fact an uphill gradient in the formation of any 
of the molecular bonds in the nucleotides in most of the proteins, since they want to pull apart. Consequently, there is no natural chemical pathway to form these. Rather, there is a move away from their formation to equilibrium. In the following sections, we examine the thermodynamic principles governing living systems. Thermodynamics in isolated systems. One form of the statement of the second law of thermodynamics is the amount of energy available for useful work in a given isolated system is de decreasing. The entropy, that is the dissipated energy per degree Kelvin, which can no longer be used to do work, is always increasing. Thus, according to the second law, heat always flows from hot to cold. In the process, it can be made to do work, but always some energy will be lost to the environment. And that energy cannot be retrieved. Water flows downhill and loses potential energy, which is changed into kinetic energy. This can again be made to do work, as, a as in a hydroelectric po power plant. However, some energy will be lost, such that if one was to use all the energy generated to pump the same water back up to its source, it would not reach the same level. The difference of original potential energy to that corresponding to the new level divided by the temperature, which in that case is virtually constant, is the entropy of the system. Such a measure will always give an entropy gain. Non-isolated systems, in that the second law of inevitable entropy increases I, applies to an isolated system. Some have maintained that with a closed that is, boundaries open to heat transfer, or open system, which is boundaries open to heat and mass transfer, one could have entropy decreasing in one area while the overall entropy of the two systems together is increasing. This uh, dem entropy deficiency, this demonstrates the reality of how the underlying principles of energy flow and its, and its use to do useful work still applies to open systems. Energy, extra energy is, is of no use unless there is a mechanism to use it. And he goes on to say, in the debate considering origins where the thermodynamic considerations are in view, much is made of the fact that the Earth is an open system receiving energy and some mass transfer from extraterrestrial sources. The main source of energy, of course, is the sun. When one considers non-isolated systems where heat transfer can take place at the boundary, some have argued that by adding energy to the original into the original system, then one should be able to reverse the overall trend of entropy increase. But this is not the case. Adding energy without an existing mechanism, which can make use of that additional energy, generally leads to simply the heating up of the surroundings faster than it would have what would otherwise have been the case. There can be cases where differential heating can occur in the atmosphere or in the earth where rock and soil have thermal conductivity differences, following the same principle as outlined in figure six. Locally, the entropy, that is, um, the change in uh, heat gained by the system divided by time, can increase at different rates pardon me, divided by temperature, can be increased at different rates and give rise to a deficiency in entropy in one location compared with another. This can potentially give rise to free energy which can do work. Thus, for instance, Fresky considers the entropy deficiency that sometimes can occur in a pile of bricks or rubble receiving energy from the sun and that a device could make use of that energy supply. But notice you have to have a device. Under the given conditions, an entropy, by the way, these are his dots, not mine. An, ener an entropy deficiency is in fact generated in the pile. After several hours of exposure to the sun, the temperature will be higher at the top than at the bottom. If we were to measure the temperatures throughout the pile, it would be a fairly simple matter to calculate the entropy deficiency. Useful energy could actually be extracted from the pile by means of a thermocouple, for example. The last sentence concerning energy extraction actually demonstrates that the point at issue is not so much whether deficiency in entropy can take place and thus useful energy can be made to do work, so much as the capacity to use the energy available. Whether it is capturing directly the energy input from the sun or harvesting 
the differential energy flow due to entropy deficiency, a mechanism for making use of that energy flow is essential. Without the thermocouple in Fresky's illustration, very little will happen without directed purpose behind it. In section 3.2 below, we define a machine as a functional device that can do work. And it then follows that only by having in existence such a mechanism for capturing the incoming energy can further useful work be achieved. Can negative entropy be harvested from somewhere else? Prigogine and others, see for example Steyer, have proposed that there is information in the non-material arrangement and organization of systems and refers to an organizational energy or logical entropy. They propose the addition of other entropies which could then feed negative entropy into a given non-isolated systems. Consequently, the total entropy is considered to be um, ds is equal to the temperature entropy plus the logical entropy, where ds logical represents the ordering principle or logical en negative entropy which gradually seeps into the system. Thus, even though ds overall is increasing with the thermal energy DST positive, the presence of DS logical coming in at the boundary ensures locally the low entropy needed to spark evolutionary development. Now notice, where does that DS logical come from? Steyer speaks of a net entropy influx at the Earth which would then be the source of evolution of earlier prokaryotes or, a pro or to eukaryotic individuals. Thus, complexity and the ordering principle is predicated on the notion that information can gradually increase from, uh, from a random state. Again, this is flawed for two reasons. Firstly, as stated above in section 2.2.2, no flux of energy from outside the system can be made to do work within the system unless there is a necessary machinery to capture the energy. Secondly, the information itself that is the message and meaning behind the communication, is not defined in purely thermodynamic terms or even in any ordered code such as DNA when considering biological systems. Git has shown that information is hierarchical in at least five levels, so he's depending fairly heavily upon Git's argument, which we saw very, very much earlier here. Um, There are five levels. Two important levels are code, or language, and message, which uses the code communication system. Neither of these can actually be thought of as arising simply from a flux of entropy locally. Rather, the reverse of this is the reality. That is, the non-material information, that is, arrangement and coded instruction, sits on a material substrate in living systems, and the non-material information arrangement or coding causes a thermodynamic effect. That is, the information causes things to happen thermodynamically that would not otherwise. Free energy in machines. In order to propose an alternative understanding of the information in living systems, one of the key parts of the argument concerns the available of energy, availability of energy to do work, coupled with a mechanism for harnessing of that energy. Free energy. The Gibbs free energy is defined, and those of you who took chemistry will remember this, from way back when, uh, is defined as the net energy available to do work. It effectively takes away the unusable lost energy associated with entropy from the enthalpy, which can be considered as the, regarded as the total thermodynamic energy available. Thus, uh, Gibbs free energy equals the enthalpy minus the product of entropy and temperature. And uh, if the temperature is held constant, then this second formula obtains. Machines and raised free energies. As a consequence of the principles of thermodynamics applied to non-isolated systems, one can state that the following applies concerning the spontaneity of chemical reactions. If the Gibbs free energy is less than zero, it's a favored reaction that happens spontaneously. If the Gibbs free energy equals zero, then you have a reversible reaction, which means that you have equilibrium. 
as many are going to one side as are going to the other side. And if the Gibbs free energy is greater than zero, you have a disfavored reaction. It's going to be non-spontaneous. You're going to have to work to make it work. And by the way, all of the reactions except for hydrogen bonding in DNA are Gibbs free energy greater than zero. You have to force them to make them work. Consequently, a positive free energy device cannot arise spontaneously. It always requires another operational machine to enable the free energy to be loaded or primed ready to do the work. To bring the molecules together which form living polymers requires an initial input of ordered energy to cause them to stay together. Delta G is positive. This leads to a definition. We define a machine as a device which can locally raise the free energy to do useful work. And remember, since it's delta G is H minus T delta S, that means that you're either going to have to raise the enthalpy, the total energy, or you're going to have to decrease. Uh, if you're going to raise the free energy, you're going to have to decrease the entropy. Thus, the free energy argument applies to both, applies both to isolated systems with no contact with the surroundings and non-isolated systems. The latter includes open systems where heat and mass can cross the boundary as well as closed systems where just heat is allowed to cross. One can now consider what happens if energy is added to a non-isolated system, as in section 2.2. And it is evident that without a machine, the free energy to do useful work is not increased. Certainly no new machine will arise simply by adding random energy into an existing system. Furthermore, the random energy input that may cause an internal energy flow will not do useful work unless an existing machine is present. Thus, with direct sunlight, a solar cell is a machine in this, direct, in this definition, since it is a free energy device to convert solar energy to electricity in order to do work. A wind turbine uses energy from the wind to convert to electricity. But a tornado, though it produces entropy deficiency, is not a machine since there is no functionality, but rather is an example of naturally occurring differential dissipation of energy. Thermodynamic law of non-isolated systems. The principle in, of, outlined in section 3.2 considering the importance of free energy has been discussed by Sewell um, and can be expressed succinctly in the following thermodynamic law of non-isolated systems. And this is the one we discussed last week, so this is paper's building on that. In an unisolated system, the free energy potential will never be greater than the total of that which was already initially in the isol isolated system and that coming in through the boundary. That is, if you're going to increase free energy, you're going to have to import it. Crystal formation. Coming back to the biochemistry of DNA and the formation of amino acids, proteins, and all the ingredients of living cells, to suggest that reactions on their own can be moved against the free energy principle is not true, since that situation could not be sustained. The DNA <coughs> molecule, along with all the nucleotides and other biopolymers, could not radi uh, change radically such that a low entropy situation would emerge. Certainly the situation cannot emerge whereby a sustained and specific sequence of thousands of raised free energy states of different molecular bonds is held without a final subsiding to a new equilibrium where the free energies are dissipated. So s some have argued that surely crystal formation is a counterexample where low energy uh, entropy is achieved and an ordering principle is obtained. Consider again equation 2b. If delta H is negative, but delta S is also negative, then one can get cases where the net change in Gibbs free energy uh, is zero. These cases, as referred to in equation three, are examples of reversible reactions and particularly happen at conditions of change of phase, such as water going to ice crystals at zero degrees centigrade or 273 Kelvin. The entropy reduction multiplied by the temperature exactly balances the drop in enthalpy. That is the case of crystal formation. And it would be true for salt crystals uh, precipitating out of water and all other kinds of crystal formation. 
the entropy reduction multiplied by the temperature exactly balances the drop in enthalpy. One can liken the delta S in this equation to being the logical geometric influence on the thermodynamics such that the order inherent in the molecules themselves given a low enough temperature will cause the crystals of a particular shape to form. Now I want to point out one thing. DNA is different from crystals in, in a very important way. And that is the crystals are periodic. The DNA is aperiodic. The, the bases make sense in terms of information. They do not make sense in terms of crystal structure. And and that uh, the second thing is that the DNA bases do not interact with each other in a significant way so that if you have one T, the next one should be an A and the next one should be a C and the next one should be a G or something like that. In fact, the ability to for a DNA to carry information is specifically um, dependent on the fact that you can put any base you want to and the thermodynamics do not dictate which base goes where. Whereas in the sodium crystal, sodium chloride crystal, or the water crystal for that matter, the thermodynamics do, uh, combined with the molecules themselves, or the atoms themselves, or the ions themselves, do dictate which one comes next. Next to chlorine, you will always find sodium. Next to sodium, you'll always find chlorine, and not another chlorine. For, uh, for the chlorine, for example. When such a compound is cooled to produce crystals, it is worth noting, however, that it's not the cooling itself which causes the crystals to occur, but the response to the molecular bonding, which is very precise within the material and has a definite function of the state variables. Once this is regarded, often this is regarded as demonstrating a new ordering principle emerging, and thus an arrangement for moving to functional form within a system, when in fact the ordering principle is latently already there in the structure of the chemical elements to begin with, which is not the case with, for example, DNA. And most importantly, there is no new production of, free en of a free energy device or machine. The change in free energy is precisely zero, so there's no free energy device emerging that can do useful work. That is in contrast to DNA, which is being made by little tiny machines. Biopolymer formation. Now consider briefly the HCN going to C5, H5, N5 example that Kenneth Miller discussed and we started with in the, in the introduction. Given the right temperature and pressure in a container, hydrogen, cyanide, and energy form an electric spark, will produce adenine. Is this a gain in net free energy such that a molecular machine can be made? The answer is negative. Like crystallization, the system is simply responding to external changes in temperature and pressure. Yes, it is producing adenine, and yes, adenine is used as one of the nucleotides in DNA. But Kenneth Miller did not refer to the ensuing thermodynamic hurdles to then build the sugar phosphate bonds, or I might add the sugar base bonds, the three other nucleotides, and the weak hydrogen bonds which can couple the, the paired nucleotides together, that is, thymine to adenine, all requiring positive free energy steps. That is, they will break apart if left to themselves. Now, there is one error in that sentence, and that is the hydrogen bonds, in fact, um, do form spontaneously. Um, DNA will anneal if you simply allow it to <coughs> cool enough. Um, but the other bonds he is precisely correct in. On top of this, one has the homochirality issue. That is to say, uh, you're dealing with left-handed or right-handed sugars. Stanley Miller acknowledged that the difficulties were indeed formidable when in 1991 he stated to Scientific American that the problem of the origin of life has turned out to be much more difficult than I and most other people imagined. And that is a rather major understatement. Hoogstein base pairing, I'm not going to go over that um, uh, except to read. That is, there's already evidence that there's a further layer of information transfer and evidence beyond just the standard base pairing. This again requires control of a suite of thermodynamic raised free energies by a different information system. <coughs> 
Put another way, the carrier molecules of the information in living systems are actually kept in a non-equilibrium state <coughs> by the very presence of the coded information. They would fall apart to a disordered equilibrium state if it were not for the information in the system making them act that way. That's not actually the information in the DNA itself. That's the information in little machines that go around correcting the DNA. Only with the presence of a free energy device, a machine already existing, will an energy flux outside the system do useful work and enable a lower, local lowering of the entropy of the system. This is illustrated for photosynthesis in figure 9, where it is evident that the machinery of the production of chlorophyll in the leaf acts <coughs> as an important system for taking carbon in carbon dioxide and forming sugars in oxygen. The energy flux on its own would do nothing unless there was a machine already present, a free energy device to enable the system to do work using the sunlight. And you can see this very easily uh, in uh, certain areas of the country where it's well watered enough, plants grow, and they take in light and they produce oxygen out of carbon dioxide and uh, as a, a side effect which is one they like very much they produce uh, sugars and, and from there on uh, more plant. Interestingly enough if you're out in the desert particularly certain areas of the desert where uh, um, there aren't significant living organisms, the sunlight falls and it doesn't do anything to produce sugars or oxygen out of carbon dioxide. You need the machine before it will work. From a, for a pure materialist there may be a natural reticence to adopting such an approach because of their presuppositions. But the evidence of the thermodynamics of living systems supports the view that it is information in living systems that controls the thermodynamics and not the other way around. That's what the machines are for. A different paradigm, information definitions, I'm going to skip over that because those definitions are um, fairly similar to what we saw with Git some weeks ago. A different paradigm, in principles of information and thermodynamics, and again I'm going to skip over that part. Uh, principles of information exchange, we postulate the following principles of information exchange. And uh, the first principle concerning information, language, and communication says, apart from creative intelligence, information cannot be derived from nothing. There has to be a precursor bank of such information. This is a parallel principle to the principle of conservation of mass and energy, the first law of thermodynamics. Actually, to be precise, it's parallel to half of it because although you can destroy information, you can't create it without some kind of a, a precursor bank of information, as, they, as he puts it. The second principle concerning information, language and communication is, apart from a sustaining intelligence, all information degenerates in terms of its functional utility. Information will corrupt unless it is sustained by an intelligent agent. It may take a long time, but it does. Ten years from now, you'll find the uh, information in your CDs non-readable. This principle is a parallel to the second law of thermodynamics, which effectively states that a, in a given isolated system, the energy available for doing useful work is diminishing. There's a principle of decay. So this is, this is basically the second law. It can't increase on its own it can decrease on its own. The principle of information gain, the principle, the important content in the system is never greater than the total of that which was there already and that coming in through the boundary of the system. This is basically last week's uh, paper restated. This principle mirrors the thermodynamic laws of non-isolated systems. Principles of information interaction with energy and matter in biological systems. Um, and again, those are stuff that we have seen already. And then I'll come to the conclusion. The three views of the information, the three views of information and reality or ontology are considered in this paper. The first is matter, is that matter and energy is all there is. And that information 
doesn't really exist. The second scenario is a variation of the bottom-up approach. In this view, the information is regarded as non-material but has arisen out of matter and energy. Both these approaches are flawed on two counts. Firstly, they ignore the fact that real information systems are not defined by the codes and languages they use. Once you define the code or the language, it doesn't mean that you stop there. Now you are able to put information into those codes and languages. And that the arrangement of the physical objects used in the system for DNA, this would be nucleotide triplets, has to be in a specific order, a specified order. Secondly, there is an impossible thermodynamic barrier to such an approach. The information in living systems is mounted on molecules with a raised free energy, such as the carriers of information would fall apart in, into equilibrium chemistry were it not for the information present. The third view, then, that we've proposed in this paper is the top-down approach. In this paradigm, the information is non-material and constrains the local thermodynamics to be in a non-equilibrium state of raised free energy. It is the information which is the active ingredient, and the matter and energy are passive to the laws of thermodynamics within the systems. Matter and energy just simply behave like they always do, but information guides that behavior. As a consequence of this approach, we have developed in this paper some suggested principles of information exchange, which have some parallels with the laws of thermodynamics which undergird this approach. And that's the end of the paper. And now I'm going to give you my own uh, view of the, of the uh, paper. There are some weaknesses in Macintosh's approach. I, I think he doesn't emphasize the difference between order and complex order enough, making that distinction between the crystal and, and the DNA. He doesn't deal with tolerances and part fitting, which uh, I think he could. That's a correctable problem with the paper. Um, that, for example, if you were to randomly somehow assemble a piston and a, uh, uh, and a sleeve that it's supposed to fit into, they have to be the same size, or else the piston won't work in the sleeve. It's not enough just simply to have a perfect shape. It's also important to have perfect size. He doesn't deal with the quantitative aspects of entropy. Um, that is, it makes a big difference whether you're trying to account for a small variation or a large variation. Um, and I, th I think that, uh, however, one can take his approach and expand it. And I think that his concept of the requirement for a machine to actually use energy is particularly insightful. If it were not for plants, the desert would be completely, the desert would not produce uh, sugars out of carbon dioxide and water. Macintosh makes a reasonable case that the entropy does not decrease in an open system without machinery to cause this decrease. Now, don't expect Macintosh's argument to be conceded by those on the other side. If conceded, it is fatal to the standard Darwinian position, and more importantly, to atheism. And this point is rather obvious. It doesn't take a lot of brains to figure that out. In fact, expect Darwin is to use evolution as a counterexample to Macintosh's thesis. We know Macintosh can't be right because evolution happened which, of course, is reasoning in a circle. We know our conclusion is correct, therefore he can't be right. Part of the question, as I said last week, is whether an argument is evidence, strong evidence, or reasonable proof. Nothing except mathematics is absolute proof, and not even perhaps then. Uh, legally, it is, uh, as they would say, the preponderance of evidence, clear and convincing evidence, and proof beyond reasonable doubt. This argument from the second law should be clear and convincing <coughs> evidence, in my opinion. But the problem is there's no way the other side will give up their religion based on such evidence. So in a way, it's kind of a, uh, uh, it's a pointless exercise unless one is willing to accept 
that uh, it really should make a difference. <laughs> but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. We have microphones for uh, uh, this one behind you. Uh, yeah, did somebody want to talk? And I know you did. I saw a hand over here, but maybe not. Okay, go ahead. Listen to what you've been saying the last three weeks and some reading I've been doing. Um, I come to the conclusion that the, the naturalists, the advocates of the naturalist camp, while they may be doing good science, if you, even if you concede that, and I'm not qualified to say if they're doing good science or not, uh, they're doing pretty lousy philosophy. And we can get an idea of this by looking at the debate uh, from the perspective of the problem of underdetermination. So any scientist or anyone involved in research of any kind must be open to the possibility that the hypothesis is this working or account is underdetermined by the facts or data to be explained. That is to say, there may be another hypothesis or even several that account as well for the data being studied. Now, as I understand that these authors and you, people like you, are open to that. I mean, that's, that's fine. All you're saying is let us look for signs of intelligent design in nature and then see what works best to explain those signs and don't rule that out. But the naturalist will have none of this. Searle, the, who's a naturalist who wrote this book here called uh, The Construction of Social Reality, who tries to say that his naturalist hypothesis accounts even for insti what he calls institutional facts, like property, money, all the various institutions, um, says that it's no longer in debate, our hypothesis is no longer in debate, that reality comprises particles, fields of force, organized into systems, and natural selection. So he takes the ontology which underlines their hypothesis no longer can become an issue. So the only project he has is to show how, given that to be the truth, we can explain everything else, the, uh, the superstructure, if you were. Now, this doesn't make the problem of underdetermination go away. I mean, it's still there, but I, but I, I see them um, dismissing everything else by appealing to the idea of a redundancy of the alternative. He says, okay, maybe that's true. However, since the ungrounding ontology of our hypothesis is non-negotiable, all we need to show is that it accounts for the data. And if it does, then all other hypotheses which are not grounded in our non-negotiable ontology are redundant. Now, that approach to me signals dogmatism of the worst kind at best and probably disingenuousness. Well, I, I have to agree with you. I, when people start saying that this position is non-negotiable, um, it doesn't seem that there's much point in negotiating. Um, and and what, it, what it does suggest is that you're going to rule out of bounds anything that doesn't uh, comport with this non-negotiable position. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I thought that science was supposed to be reasonable, consider the best possibility wherever it comes from, um, but evidently there are some possibilities that are simply ruled out at the beginning. And actually, I think if we can establish that that's what's going on, then it becomes a little more, uh, the, the choice becomes a little more clear. And I think that uh, getting clarity in this is probably as important as getting agreement, maybe in some cases more so, because if you have somebody who they know what they're going to believe and it, uh, the, the evidence doesn't really matter, then if you know that up front, you know better than to argue with them. We have a comment back. Well, this is just, <coughs> just further comment on this philosophical aspect. This week I read a small book which is a written report of a, a debate <coughs> between Alvin Plantinga and Daniel Dennett. 
And I thought Dennett's responses were very helpful to the Christian cause, in the sense that... Um, Which is not what he, you'd assume. He had... He had, it, it, as I see it, he had nothing intellectually meaningful or credible to say. He relied totally on ridicule and arrogance. You know, he's, he's answering from the position of power, uh, from the view that it is, is so uh, dominant. No, he didn't really respond to uh, Plantinga's comments. It is of interest that uh, my understanding is that in philosophy, Christianity has made some rather remarkable inroads. It still hasn't done that in evolutionary biology, but uh, but in uh, in philosophy now you'll find a, a substantial minority, perhaps a majority, in in some areas of of people who are theists and and Christians in particular. Uh, and I think that uh, the reason why is because the philosophical underpinnings just aren't very good. Yeah, um, and Dennett just Dennett just disregarded all of that, as, as his response is that Christianity is like um, Supermanism. I mean, it's just nothing. So uh, you know, why even talk about it? Well, you see, what he's doing is he's ruling it out of bounds to begin with, and once you realize that, then you realize that if he claims there's lots of evidence, well, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but uh, he's got to show it to you before you you're willing to buy it because he has um, some bias in that direction. It's a little bit like, uh, I you know, if you're asking somebody whether they are, uh, you know, a Ford or a Chevy is better. Um, well, you know, it depends on who you ask. If you ask somebody who doesn't particularly have a dog in the hunt, but uh, is, is pretty skilled at mechanics and... Uh, you'll probably get a decent answer. If you ask a Ford salesman, well... <laughs> and that once we realize that these people are Ford salesmen, it makes it easier to evaluate the evidence they give. Uh, you mentioned... Is dead? Tap it. Hello? It, it's working. It's, it's working. totally close. Okay. You mentioned that uh, the integrity of information is preserved thanks to intelligence. Otherwise, it's it de tends to degrade with time. Right. I performed an experiment some years ago. I took a very clear copy of one page copy of a document and made a copy. Then took the copy and made a copy of the copy. I went up to about 30 copies and uh, it was hard to read. So my question... And if you did it a hundred times it might be impossible to read. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is with all the copying that goes in DNA in the function of human beings how can we explain the fact that human beings are still resemble, in a way, the first human being? I mean, if, it's, if, it, if the human life has been in existence for millions of years, then the problem is so incredible that any intelligent human being has to accept that has been some, how do you say, uh, intervention, intelligent intervention to preserve human beings for so long? Well, there's a difference between DNA copying and human copying. There's, there's two differences that are important. Uh, number one is that because of its nature, DNA is entirely digital. Whereas if you're doing a copier, it b technically it's digital, but there's so many digits to it that it becomes almost analog to where you can have the, the letters slowly fade uh, and still be the same letter. If you have DNA, you either have adenine or you don't, and there's no 
there's no half adenine or three quarters adenine or one tenth adenine. So you can't fade the adenine out of the way. That's number one. So the copies tend to be uh, tend to be better in that way. They don't fade with time. The second one is that when you have a mutation, the body has all kinds of ways to, to correct that mutation. And um, Without the intervention of any outside source? Well, without the intervention of a, uh, of a de definitively shown to be outside source. What I mean by that is that there are actual proteins that are coded for in the DNA that go through and look for thymine dimers, uh, look for mismatches between thymine and, your, and, uh, and adenine or, or between, s say, uh, cytosine and, and uh, guanine. When that uh, agree uh, with the deistic uh, philosophy that God created the, the first uh, human being or whatever and let it run its course? Um, it's compatible with that philosophy. It's, um, as our gentleman here was noting, underdetermined. You know, you could say that, that, that God intervenes periodically and, 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 you know, creates these things in the DNA. On the other hand, I suppose if we were to go back far enough and we got some DNA from, let's say, the Iceman or something like that and found this particular mechanism in, in the Iceman um, from supposedly 5000 BC or whatever the date's supposed to be, that you could say, well, it's probably always been there. Uh, my, my inclination is to say that it's something that was put into Adam and Eve at the beginning and that uh, has just simply been preserved to this day uh, in most people. And probably you'll find that there will be some people that uh, don't have it and those people won't live as long. It may not even reach adulthood, in which case, of course, they won't pass on their genes to any anybody else. But those kinds of mechanisms are there. They're there specifically to correct things. So it's as if your copier had a little uh, thing they went through and says, that A isn't uh, good enough. We need to refresh it a little bit. Um, so that's the reason why DNA works better than your copying machine. Now, does it work perfectly? No. And one can show that approximately 120 places in every person's DNA, they don't reflect their parents. And the vast majority, if not all of those, are, wrong, are, are worse than the parents. So we are degenerating. And that raises the question, could we have been around for millions of years? And I think the answer is, without divine intervention, no. Uh, we have a couple of comments here, and then Ariel Roth. Just um, a, if, as I understand, deism, it's different from this, though. Isn't deism the idea, well, God started the universe and let it evolve? <laughs> Where in this case, he just made a machine that's reliable, that works. Right. But, yeah, uh, this, uh, this is not deism. E even if you try to add long ages to it, it's intervention periodically to make it better. So it's, it's compatible with this approach, even though it's not the one that uh, either I or you favor. Um, it's easier, to, it's easier to, to start with creationism and God simply put in this perfect machine and then uh, made provision for minor corrections, perhaps at the Tree of Life, um, periodically. Um, and then once we sinned, basically it was allowed to degenerate slowly, and that's what we're doing. Uh, but you could postulate a God that stepped in every once in a while and then created a, uh, you know, fish and then uh, amphibians and then uh, dinosaurs, uh, uh, reptiles, and then various other creatures. And 
finally stepped in and created man, and that man has been degenerating, but he's only uh, 20,000, 100,000, or whatever you want to put it, years old. Um, as the thing of it is, once you get God involved, uh, unless you put limits on God's activity, uh, you suddenly, uh, you can't determine scientifically how old we are. Which means that you've got to listen to what God has to say. And it sure looks like he intended us to believe 6,000 more or less years. Yes, and then... I assume it was a 19th century statement by Ellen White that said that if God had not endowed Adam with such, whatever you want, life, that we would have become extinct ere this. So there is a degradation, whether it's genetic or something else, we are going downhill. And the interesting thing is for the historical period, you can find people arguing that we're not as smart as cavemen. And their arguments are pretty good. Uh, the ancient Greeks, on the basis of minimal information, were able to determine not only that the Earth was round, but that it was 24,000 miles around. Considering that the Earth at the equator is 24,700 miles around, that's not bad. Yeah, I was just going to uh, add to, to the comments you were making. Uh, seems to me I read a while back in E. coli is about 18 proteins involved in the editing correcting system of DNA. Uh, in other words, they read the DNA. If there's an error, they take out the the um, error and put in, replace it with the correct base, uh, which is adenine or guanine or cytosine, whatever base you have. Uh, so uh, there seems to be a very definite mechanism that does it. You raise the question of divine intervention there and that. I don't know. The mechanism seems to be there and... and uh, well designed to do that. The uh, issue, of course, arises how in the world, since mutations are so common, how in the world uh, did organisms ever survive without the editing, proofreading editing system I'm talking about? Uh, you cannot have life, because errors are so common in DNA copying, you cannot have life without this editing, correcting system. Uh, so which came first, the, you know, the chicken or the egg? You, you have that particular problem. You have to have both to have life. And uh, you might claim survival value for both, but you, uh, you don't have survival value of either one without both of them being together. Uh, and we, I suppose we could add... Uh, well, that, that of course, in, uh, doesn't include the fact that you have to have the proteins that translate the DNA into other proteins, plus you have to have the DNA itself, plus you have to have either RNA to start with, or you have to have the, ribos or the DNA, uh, the RNA polymerase. Sure, and the folding uh, system and all. And how much, how much of that system do you have to have uh, and apparently it's a minimum, uh, the minimum system c contains at least 250 proteins plus uh, the DNA to, to, to code for them. It's all extremely complex. I mean, it's, uh, the more you learn about it, the more you realize how it's And, just, and you have to know why possible. the chicken crossed the road. <laughs> uh, I suppose we could just mention Sanford comes up in this picture of degeneration that you mentioned. Uh, that, that's his whole thesis of his book, is that, hey, we're degenerating. Very fortunately, we, there's enough redundancy in our systems that uh, we don't disappear in spite of all those mutations. But uh, how do you evolve redundancy? This is a serious problem because you, you've already got a system that works there. Why are you going to evolve another one? 
You know, I'll point out one other thing, and then maybe we can uh, close this uh, for today, but uh, I'll come back next week for Dr. Uh, uh, Wells' a fascinating article. But there was a point where people thought that life kind of came out like crystals. If the, the theory was called biochemical predestination, and there was a book by two people, one of whom was Dean Kenyon. I don't remember who the other one is. There's another author to it. Interestingly, Dean Kenyon came to the conclusion that, in fact, that model didn't work well. And when he came to that conclusion, he became an intelligent design advocate and, in fact, became a creationist. And John Sanford, who had the same uh, noticing that uh, genetic entropy meant that we were going downhill instead of uphill, became a short-age creationist. Because once you recognize that the degeneration is so fast that over 100,000 years, any particular species should go extinct, and the bigger species should go extinct faster than the little ones because the little ones can actually produce perfect copies of themselves, like you know bacteria, um, whereas whereas the uh, the big ones can't. Like I said, each one of us is different from our uh, predecessors by somewhere between sixty and one hundred and eighty. Uh, basis depending on whose study you're using and it probably depends on the person and you know what the mother mm -hmm. ate during pregnancy and all that stuff um, but it's a significant number of, of degenerative uh, uh, changes and he realized that the only way that you could make that work with long ages is for God to continually be supplying it over the course of 10 million years or 100 million years for a particular organism that, uh, that seems to have lineage. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to get God that involved, why not just uh, you know, have God involved at the beginning and allow us to coast after that, which makes more intuitive sense. So he became a short-age creationist. Um, and I think that this is really an important point. It's not, you don't have to be an idiot. You don't have to park your brains at the church door in order to be a creationist. Mm -hmm. It actually makes a lot of sense in, in, some, in many areas. I used to worry about how could man have survived 6,000 years. Uh, I found out since then, you know, that uh, some call it neutral mutations, others call it redundancy, and so on. We have such a built-in protective system, we've been able to survive this long. But uh, Sanford himself, he, he wonders if we're going to live uh, another century or more. Uh, the system, it's going to break down to, to where redundancy is not going to help anymore. We Oh, we do have a mic here. We'll give you we'll give you one shot at it. Sure. Go ahead. I just have a question about uh, kind of the beginning of the argument that the uh, first gentleman uh, near the beginning when you read it was talking about where you make uh, the uh, hydrogen cyanide into the, the adenine. And so he kind of stopped that argument there and said, OK, well that kind of proves that second law isn't, isn't a problem. And, but then you had mentioned about the other uh, proteins, the guanine and et cetera. Yeah, the so other bases, uh-huh. What percentage, like if you just did the base experiment and put the uh, hydrogen cyanide in the jar and sparked it, and how much how much of the time do you get the adenine out? And then what would be the same basis for the other, the other pairs? So where does the, well, if you want the argument answer, break? If you want the answer to that, it's very simple. You get 100% adenine, that's it. You don't get any of the other stuff. 
Um, there is one experiment that claimed to get it. It's based on two-dimensional chromatography. I'm not sure how valid that is. Certainly, they got a spot that was in the right place. Um, nobody else that I know of has reported it, and it looks like we're not getting guanine at all, and it doesn't look like we're getting cytosine or uracil at all either. So from the from the looks of it, adenine's the only thing that's made. So they would so all, it's you know they would all start from the same ingredients in the jar, basically. Yeah, well, the problem is that you don't get the other stuff. Hydrogen cyanide is made easily, and adenine is made out of hydrogen cyanide, but the other ones aren't made out of hydrogen cyanide. They have oxygen and various other stuff on them. And so you can't, they, they, don't, they aren't made as easily, and for practical purposes they're not made at all. Which raises some very interesting questions about why we got our four base system if three of the bases aren't around. Now there's recently something that suggested if you started ribose and you added some things you could get uh, maybe cyanide, well, uh, pardon me, maybe, maybe cytosine, but you have to do that with what basically amounts to chemical synthesis. And I don't think anybody disputes the idea that if a chemist wants to get in there and, and put just the right amounts of stuff in it that one can <coughs> synthesize slowly. Um, I mean, could be, you know, the, the body does that, after all, automatically with enzymes. The question is, can you do it without a chemist involved? Because the chemist is intelligent design. And the answer appears to be no. Which means that you don't even get started. You know, it's a little bit like asking, well, how do you hit a home run if you can't get to first base? 